Welcome to Actual Faith. I'm your host, Jeremy Scott de Spain, and this channel is committed to building the faith of Christians through a biblical worldview. And I am with Eric Hernandez. He is a licensed minister and the apologetics lead for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. He has spoken and debated on a public level at university campuses where he adamantly defends the Christian faith against atheist, agnostic, and deistic professors of different worldviews. Uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Hey, would you just take a moment and let people know where they can find out more about you? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can go to uh, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Eric Hernandez. Um, you can go to texasapologetics.org and you can see some conferences that we have going on. Um, uh, I mean, I, as you said, I'm the apologetics lead for Texas Baptist and that encompasses doing these conferences. So that's that's a for sure place to if you want to catch uh, catch me uh, in person, so to speak, uh, you can check on there. That's great. Well, I'm going to provide links in the description of this video that you can uh, further get acquainted with Eric, his ministry. I'm thankful to have the conversation today with Eric. We're going to talk about the human soul and how it relates to the mind and the body. So if you're interested in the soul, and maybe you haven't even thought about this on a philosophical level, you know what the Bible has to say about the soul, about the spirit, maybe how they're similar, how they're different, and also how maybe psychology today or those that might consider themselves atheists deal with this mind-body problem that sometimes comes into play. Uh, I want to just take a moment and just encourage you to share this video with somebody. Uh, subscribe to the Actual Faith channel if you're not subscribed already. Uh, like this video if you're finding it useful. And uh, just take a moment, comment, share your feedback, and we're glad that you're with us today. So as we get started, Eric, would you mind maybe just taking a moment and giving us a quick summary of the mind-body problem? Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess the first thing I'd say is, uh, so I don't think there is a mind body problem, at least not if you're a Christian or a theist, but I, uh, typically what's called the mind body problem it essentially revolves around the question uh, about consciousness and how consciousness arises or where does it come from? The reason I say it's not a problem for us is because um, if you have at the origin, at its core, at the very beginning, an unembodied, all powerful, omniscient, omnipotent um, mind, God, namely, then it's it's not at any stretch of the imagination to say that he could create smaller souls or minds. That's us. However, if all that exists is physical and there is nothing immaterial and there was no first um, unembodied mind, there was no first consciousness. If consciousness is not fundamental to a worldview, then you're going to have to give an explanation for how it came into existence and, and how it arises and what it is. So the mind-body problem is typically, um, I would say it's a problem for the naturalist perspective or for an atheist worldview. Um, now, what someone can also mean by the mind-body problem, um, something related, is how the uh, uh, soul or mind interact with the body. Uh, but that's more considered the interaction problem. Um, and as I said, the mind-body problem would be more really a problem, like I said, for the naturalist or atheistic worldview. Yeah, that's good. So can you just elaborate a little more? I mean, why is the concept of the human soul important biblically and philosophically? I chose you to come on the channel, talk about this, because I know you're passionate about the soul. We share similar views, and I just want you to just elaborate more on that concept, biblically and philosophically. Why is this important? So good question. Um, so whenever I, I go to churches and do talks on the soul or anything like that, even just apologetics, um, one of the things I, I point out are what the Bible calls strongholds or what some might know as worldviews philosophically. Mm -hmm. And um, a stronghold, biblically speaking, are things that would hinder someone from coming to the knowledge of God. Now, naturalism would be a worldview, if I can just simplify in saying that um, it's a view that nothing immaterial exists. Everything is just physical. Um, now, if this is a case, then you, this would mean that if consciousness exists, it would have to be identical or reducible to something like the brain. Now, um, now I, I say that to kind of give some context, because as I'm going into this and explaining it, uh, one thing I like to point out is how a lot of these strongholds have crept into the church and we haven't noticed. And you might think, how in the world would something like naturalism 
crept into the church without us noticing. Mm. So here's what I do. I, 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 as I'm talking to the audience, I say, here's, here's going to be an opportunity for some um, interaction, audience feedback. And I ask the audience to point to what part of your body thinks. And every single time, people do this. Mm. And so my question is, brain, are you saying it's your brain that thinks? And they say, yes. Okay. And then I ask, do you need a brain to think? And most people say yes. And then I ask, does God have a brain? And people stay quiet. And, and uh, I kind of wait a second, and I double-check to make sure we're not at a Mormon church. Uh, they do believe God is physical. And, of course, the answer is no. God does not have a brain. Well, does God think? Yes, he does. Psalm says his thoughts towards us are more than the grains of sand. So now we have what seems like a conundrum. If God doesn't have a brain, but he thinks, and the next question could be, are we made in his image? Well, of course, Scripture says we are. So it, there seems to be, at this point, you can see people kind of getting uncomfortable. But what's what's really uh, uh, bizarre to me is not that um, – it's not, it's not an uncomfortable – uh, a conundrum really the only way it would be a conundrum is if you believe it's your brain that thinks so the problem is and i'm giving you the, the the nutshell version is that we live in a culture that tells us your brain thinks and it's as if the church and the culture has made this uh almost um this uh, unspoken agreement that uh if um because of neuroscience we know that when you're when you think there are neurolog there's neurological activity i'm about to sneeze if it's coming okay it left <laughs> and um so we know that when you're when you think there's neurological activity. Um, so it's as if the the culture of the world says, okay, let's let's just say the brain thinks, and it's almost like you know we can be neutral in that sense, but that's not neutral. That's naturalism. So we live in a culture, and we're told your brain thinks, and we just sure it it, it seems innocent enough to me, but then we come to the church Sunday morning, we lift our hands and worship a God who has no brain and thinks just fine. But we don't th let these two beliefs come together because we'd be in trouble and we don't really take our theology seriously. So um, that, that's just one uh, of many implications. Here's the, the most damaging, I'd say. My introduction to, um, to this problem was through an atheist philosophy professor who essentially said, if I have this physical pill, how could it have the power to affect my soul, which is supposed to be not physical? And again, the rundown version, he's basically said, what's well, because there's no soul. We're just the brain and body were just figures in chemistry. What bothered me about that was up until that point in my life, I had heard a lot of complaints against Christianity. But there's a difference between a complaint and an objection. Uh, someone can complain. I don't like, let's say someone says, I don't like the shirt that I'm wearing, which we're both wearing green. Uh, look at that, Molinism. <laughs> uh, I don't like the shirt you're wearing. Well, that doesn't mean I don't exist. It's a complaint against me. But with respect to this, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection of the dead, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing, then Christianity is false. Well, I would say by the same line of logic, if there's no soul, there could be no resurrection, and thus Christianity would be false. So here I heard for the first time in my life an objection that if true would mean Christianity was false. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's quite very much so important because people tend to think, if you were to ask the average Christian, what is a soul, at least in my experience, the kind of answer I get is really the thing that goes to heaven when you die, as if that's the only thing a soul is. And that leads to other confusions that we, we won't get into unless you want to. But in essence, um, and the arguments for the soul also point to why it's important, even just uh, philosophically and just for the average person, a few to, to name really quick is, well, if, if I don't have a soul and I'm just a brain and body, then I don't maintain what's called identity through change and part replacement. For example... If you take a tricycle and you remove one of its wheels, you can say in a metaphysical sense, a tricycle has ceased to exist and a bicycle has come into existence. Yeah. And that shows us that when it comes to purely physical objects, they do not maintain identity through change or part replacement. Well, if, God forbid, my limbs were to be you know, chopped off or if I were to have something, you know, a transplant, am I still the same person? Well, if I'm a brain and body, no. You'd have to say it's a different person. But if I am a soul that transcends the body, that grounds my identity to change. Um, well, then I'm not just a brain and body and the soul exists. So even something as simple as, am I the same person from one moment to the next or, you know, throughout my lifetime? Or is this a different person coming into existence every time something changes? Free will, that, that'd be another one. If there's no soul in principle, there couldn't be free will, which means you're not responsible for your beliefs or your moral actions. And if that's the case, how can I trust anything that I believe is true? Well, some people could say, well, I could test my beliefs. Well, sure, but if you're determined to believe what you do, 
then your very tests and conclusions that you draw from these tests are going to be beliefs that were still determined. So at best, you're just determined to believe that your beliefs are true, but you're back to the same problem. So without something like a soul, I'd say Christianity would be false. Uh, we can't have free will. We're not the same from one moment to the next. And that leads into a whole other myriad of problems that, if you'd like, we can get into. But suffice it to say, it's a really big question. It is a big question. In fact, I want to take a moment and try to wrap our minds around this idea of, you said, continuity of identity. Now, for some listening in that aren't used to have a philosophy, uh, philosophy background or theology, which I'll be honest with you, I'm more of an armchair philosopher, so to speak. Uh, I, I have a degree, an advanced degree in apologetics, but really it's just touching many fields. And I think that when we think about this word, Conten this, this phrase continuity of identity, we need to think about the fact that it also has an implication of if God is going to judge us as believers and hold us morally accountable, it comes to mind that if we're just merely physical, then how can God keep us accountable? Now, I'm moving into this realm because you're using this almost as an argument of if we don't have a soul, then you believe so strongly in the soul that really Christianity couldn't exist in the theological framework that we know about it traditionally. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, let, let's let's kind of unpack this a little um, because, yeah, it is an argument I would use for the soul identity to change. Um, but let's say let's say there is no soul. If that's the case, when you die, if I were to die today, God forbid, my body would be laid in the ground and it, it would eventually decay. But then at some point, there's going to be a final resurrection. Well, if there's no soul, then when my body dies, I cease to exist. But then if there's a resurrection, then God is going to have to resurrect me. But resurrection implies that he is bringing up something. Now, if my body's decayed and I'm gone and I don't exist, in what sense can I say that God is resurrecting me as opposed to recreating a lookalike that is just like me? Um. I've heard Moreland say, you know, there, there's something to be said whether or not something can begin to exist twice. It seems something can only begin to exist once. So if I go out of existence, whatever God brings into existence that looks like me can't be me because I've already had my beginning and I can't have a second beginning, if you will. Uh, so when you look at those kind of things, um, and, and we haven't even touched on consciousness, if something's conscious, it needs to be possessed by some substance that is immaterial that would be something like a soul. So you can't have the brain being conscious because if we were to shrink down to the level of an atom and we were to walk into a brain, we would see it's mostly empty space. There's not really any room, if you will, for consciousness to creep in there, or be stored in there or, or to pop up. So the, these kind of, when you look at these kind of things at various levels, you see if there's no soul. There's a lot of problems that are going to arise. Yeah. You know, do you have any biblical examples that come to mind off? off the top of your mind uh, that we could think about the soul actually departing from the body? Because I know that this idea of say Christian physicalism isn't a new idea, although I'm hearing it become more and more prevalent today than it used to be. But there, there kind of is this option that some are taking that you can be a physicalist, but also a Christian. So it kind of bears in mind, are there some, examples from scripture other than as you mentioned we're talking about yes god holding us accountable recreation some of these concepts but do you have any scripture that comes to mind by chance uh yeah yeah a few things um so uh, physicalism we could say is a view that that there is no soul that you're just a purely physical object um th there's a number of things i can think of so uh one thing so here's a verse to just we can chew on e ecclesiastes 3:21. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth, talking about death. Moreover, within, within, a, um, within the Jewish mindset, when, when they were talking about eschatology, there was this belief in an intermediate state. Um, Paul seems to allude to this, that when he talks about um, uh, this earthly tent um, being destroyed and he talks about putting on a heavenly body, and what he talks about is wanting to just transition from here to that heavenly body and not wanting to be in a state of nakedness. This state of nakedness is what we refer to as the intermediate state. Uh, if I were to die right now, but Christ is not coming back till many years later, then there's going to be a state where I exist without a body, disembodied, awaiting the final resurrection. 
If that's the case, then all, all of a sudden we have strong biblical reason to believe that there is a uh, that you are a soul that is not identical or reducible to a body. Uh, when you look at other interesting passages, like say in the Old Testament, where the witch of Endor, I believe, uh, wanted to conjure up um, uh, Samuel, there was a law. God gave a law to not uh, against necromancy, not talking with the dead. Well, why would you give a law about something that can't happen? And with this witch of Endor who brings up Samuel, he seems, he biblically speaking, it says he shows up and she kind of freaks out. Well, if that's the case, you can only have that being the case if Samuel is not identical to a brain and body, if he's something more like a soul. Same thing with the mountain transfiguration with Jesus. You see two other people pop up who have been dead for a long time. Uh, when Jesus is talking to the Sadducees about resurrection, you know, they say, um, uh, they give this uh, argument about what if a woman, she gets married, her husband dies, and this happens seven times, whose husband will she be in heaven? And the response Jesus gives is interesting. And uh, again, the, the nutshell version, because there's so much to touch on with mm. any question you can ask. We can talk for hours. He says, have you not read that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's not the God of the dead, but the living? So he's essentially saying Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God is their God. You guys believe this. But he's a God of the living. Well, these guys died a long time ago. So if he's a God of the living, they must still be alive and well somewhere, though they don't have a physical body. And even there, there, could, there there's an argument there for the intermediate state and the resurrection. So um, lots of instances like this where um, he, he, Jesus himself says, don't be afraid of the one who can destroy the body, but body and soul. Um, Paul talks about Romans chapter 7. And tell me when to stop. Romans chapter 7, um, he's talking about the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And then he talks about the inner man and how it's worn with, with the flesh. He says, there's nothing good in me, and he, he specifies or clarifies that is my flesh. So there's this dualistic uh, sentiment that he's expressing about what I, the inner man, wants to do versus what the flesh wants to do. And he talks about how there's a war between the two. So, yeah, they're all throughout Scripture. This is, uh, I would say, not only taught but presupposed that you are more than a body and that there is something like a soul. Yeah, and I think it's important, too, to emphasize at this point for our listeners that when we talk about the soul and the body, we don't want to think of them as individual parts as much as they are parts of a whole unity. And sometimes when we speak of the soul, I think it's hard, especially for those that are Christian physicalists, to they make this, this case that there's too much partiality when we're talking about the soul, the spirit, the body, as if there's not a union there, there's not a unity. And I think it's important for us to understand that scripture does speak of it as a unity. And we're going to talk about this in a moment because soul and spirit, sometimes we'll talk about the dualistic nature of humanity, or if man is a trichotomy. And I'd be interested to get your view on that in just a moment, Eric. So just hang tight. But I think also of Genesis 35, when we talk about the soul and the body, uh, it's interesting when Rachel, she had a hard labor in Genesis 35 and she was giving birth to Benjamin and the midwife uh, made mention that, hey, don't fear, you're going to have a son. But we know that the way that Rachel had died, that she, she died because of hard labor. She travailed, and it says in Genesis 35, 18, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin, right? Her soul was in departing. Uh, and I love that phrase there of how scripture speaks of that. We also see this when uh, Elijah and the widow woman, her son dies, and uh, just praying for uh, his soul. And we see this all throughout. For me, the biggest problem that I can't get over is that continuity of identity between the departure of this life and the judgment of the next, or as you mentioned, the resurrection. That continuity of identity, I can never get a clear answer as to what maintains your identity if all we are is purely physical during that period of time. I've heard a lot of responses but nothing that's been satisfying to me when it comes to Christians and how they can purely believe we're physical, especially if most of what we do in this physical world is preparing for an invisible or an unseen realm. It's a very interesting conversation. But let's let's talk about that for a moment, Eric. I'd love to get your thoughts. Do you think man is um, 
uh, dualistic in nature or are we a trichotomy? Maybe talk a little bit about the nature of man. It's okay if you're wrestling with it. I'd just like to get your kind of open thoughts about it and the difference between the soul and the spirit, how they're similar, how they might be different. Yeah, so good question. Um, and, and even another verse that came to mind was Jesus on the cross said he gave up his spirit. Um, so a few things. Uh, first thing to say is sometimes soul and spirit are used synonymously in Scripture. I don't think they're synonymous, but I'll, I'll unpack that in, in a little bit. So a definition of the soul that I would give is that the soul is an immaterial substance that possesses consciousness and animates the body. That being said, when, when I say that, when I use the word I, the word I is what's called an indexical word, meaning it refers to something. Kind of like the word here or there refers to something. The word I is referring to me, the self, the conscious subject. So um, how do we know if something has a soul? I'd say if something's conscious, it needs a soul. It needs something that, that's possessing the consciousness. So if we have consciousness, then we have to ask, what's the thing that possesses it? Well, I know I am conscious. So what? So we then say, what is the word I? When I use the word I, what does that mean? What is it referring to? That said, I am a soul. Technically speaking, I don't have a soul, but I am a soul. And a body without a soul is just a corpse. And, and here's where I usually point out that um, if I've actually changed my position on this because I, I now do believe I have a soul. Because a few years ago, I, I bought a Kia Soul, and, and it's orange, parked in my garage right now. Um, so I am a soul. I don't, quote, have a soul. I am a soul. So that being said, <clears throat> if I am a soul that has a body, then I am not identical nor reducible to my body. To be clear, there is a deep integration and unity between the two. In fact, I would say a soul's natural state is to be embodied. And this is why Paul calls this a state of nakedness regarding the intermediate state, because um, at the final resurrection, we will have physical bodies. So we are meant to be embodied, but there is a state where the soul could be uh, disembodied. Now, that being said, what about spirit and things like that? Uh, is it a trichotomous view or a dualist view? Now, the soul is an immaterial substance. And substance dualism is essentially, uh, um, me it means twoism, and technically it's referring to two substances. Now, I would not say the body is a substance. Um, if there's no soul, the body would just be an aggregate. What's an aggregate? It's a collection of separable parts held together in a certain structure, like Lego bricks or cars or watches. These things are aggregates. They're a collection of parts. If there's no soul, the body would just be an aggregate. So the, 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 the body is not a substance in itself. Because substances are true holes, whereas aggregates are, again, think of Lego bricks. You can take these things apart. Uh, they're loosely connected cars. Um, if I take a tire off a car, that, that tire remains a tire even though it's not connected to the car because the parts are what make up the hole. So you can have the parts without the hole, whereas I am a substance. My hole is what gives me my parts. If you chop off my arm, it, it will decay and cease to exist, which tells us that part of me is dependent on me the whole. <clears throat> it's going a little deeper than I wanted to. But that said, if I am a soul, well, then you can ask what the other part of me is, is the body. It's not a substance, but it's something else. So you have to a dualistic view, a soul that has a body. Now, the reason I'm not a trichotomist is because a trichotomist would have to say, well, there's three substances or, or at least two. There's a body, there's an immaterial substance, a soul. But then there's a spiritual substance. If there, if if someone's going to be a trichotomist, they're going to have to posit three substances. But then the question would still have to become, which one is you? Now, a trichotomist could agree with me and say, well, we are not a body. We know that for sure. So that's not us. Well, then the other question is, well, then are you the soul or are you the spirit? And here's where the problem, where more problems arise. If I am a substance then I would say that the spirit is a thing that communicates with God. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, <clears throat> you have a soul and a spirit. They're not physical, but just humor me for a second. You have a soul and a spirit. If I am a soul, but the spirit was talk to, talking to God, then I'm not talking to God. The spirit is. And it's almost like there's two things in, in this one container of me. But what you can do is you can say, and what I think is the appropriate thing to do, is if you say, well, I am a soul, and my soul has a capacity for spirit. Hmm. Well, then now that's different um, because I, I, people who affirm the trichotomous view will also affirm that I have a mind. So you can say, well, so am I a mind, a soul and a spirit? They'll, they'll say, no, 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 you're a, 
you're you're a soul and there's a spirit, but your mind is part of your soul. Oh, so you allow for there to be faculties of the soul. Yes. Well, then just grab that spirit thing and throw it in the soul and let and and it's a faculty of the soul. Um, it's kind of like this. Um, I usually ask this question to to make the point. If I were to ask you what taste does your tongue taste or do you taste? It's kind of a trick question because an appropriate response would be, well, I taste by way of my tongue. So I have one body, two hands. I don't have three bodies. I have one body that has two hands, and it has a tongue, and that tongue has a capacity for receiving flavor. So I have one body with various faculties and parts. Your soul is a deep structure. It's a unity uh, uh, of different capacities and faculties. One of those faculties is uh, I have a spirit. Another is that I have a mind. But these are all within me, grounded in me, the soul, the self. So that's why I hold to a dualistic view. If you're going to hold to a trichotomous view, you're going to posit at least two, if not three substances, but you still got to ask, which one are you? But if I'm one body that has a tongue to taste, then I can be one soul that has a spirit to communicate with God. Yeah, it sounds to me that sometimes um, it becomes a misunderstanding of philosophy in the terms of philosophy. Because I feel like a lot of trichotomists believe what you explained about dualism. They just don't understand the difference between, say, um, what you'd call something physical or a substance, something that's immaterial. So parsing those out can be often difficult. But I see what you mean, especially if God uh, created the seen and the unseen realm, it would make sense that he would want us to relate to both. And the way that we relate to the physical world is with a physical body. The way we relate to the unseen realm or that spiritual realm is through the capacity of the spirit, which is why it makes sense that Paul tells us that our spirit needs to be awakened or made alive and that the natural man cannot discern the things uh, that are spiritual because they are dead, so to speak, until they're made alive, until you've been regenerated by the spirit. So uh, that's why the natural man cannot receive those things that are spiritual, that that spiritual capacity needs to be awakened. So that's so good. It just really helps us to recognize that God wants us to rightly relate to him, both in the spiritual realm and the physical realm. And one day those two will be made one. And what a beautiful thing that will be. Be looking forward uh, to that time. Um, maybe is, is there anything else that you can think of when it comes to dualism that you can help us to understand? Because as you mentioned, any of these topics, especially, especially philosophically, we could get into, but are there different kind of dualists? Is there a difference between like a substance or say like uh, any other kind of dualist out there? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, there, there are. And, and to just even touch on what you're saying about. Um, so the, these are philosophical questions. Um, sure. Someone might say, well, they're theological questions. Well, you have different religions uh, and, and even uh, people who don't necessarily believe in God, believe in the soul. They're not necessarily theological questions. They are at their core philosophical questions with theological implications. So. Um, and, and one of the things is to kind of get the point across is because someone who is a trichotomist, like I said, they believe in a soul and then they'll say, but the Bible talks about the spirit. Well, sure. It also talks about the, the, the mind. It also talks about the heart. It also talks about this. Um, so it's not as if we, we make those individual substances. Um, yeah, sometimes um, the reason I was saying earlier about I don't think they're synonymous. Sometimes the word spirit is used to refer to the whole person. But I would say that this is I think it's uh, I forget the word. Maybe it's a cynic dote. Um, it's, it's a part to whole kind of language. If I said all hands on deck, I don't want you to chop off your hand and throw it under the deck. I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting or emphasizing that I want your hand on deck to emphasize the point of what I'm asking you to, co to come for. Mainly, I want your help. I want your service. Like when someone says, can I give you a hand? Same thing. They're not chopping up their hand and giving it to you. They want your whole body on deck. But they're saying all hands on deck to emphasize they're asking for maybe some manual labor. When the Bible is emphasizing like, you know, uh, uh, the heart of a man or the inner man or the spirit of a man, it's emphasizing a particular faculty of the person, but it's talking about the whole person. It's not saying this is a separate part of a person. It's just making a distinction between the various things and capacities within a person to emphasize the point that it's trying to get across. Uh, you were asking about different types of dualism. Tell me how deep you want to go here. There are uh, one distinction is the difference between a substance dualist and a property dualist. 
Uh, a substance dualist would say that there is a soul and a body. The property dualist would say there is only a body that perhaps is a substance, which, again, I disagree with. But they'll say maybe it's the body that's a substance, but that substance has both physical properties and immaterial mental properties. So one substance but two properties, where the, whereas the substance dualist says, no, there's two substances, a soul, and then a matter, which you could call a substance, but the, the body's not wouldn't be the substance. And then you have physical properties and mental properties. So uh, that that's one of the uh, differences. Other to go further than that, it, it would would take more unpacking. But I'm good wherever you want to go. Yeah, that's okay. What I would encourage my listeners to do is check out a book by J.P. Moreland called The Soul. He actually does a great job giving a summary of all of these topics that we're speaking of, especially on a philosophical point of view. Um, so I would just encourage you to take a look at that. I really want to just introduce some of these concepts to you if you're not familiar with them. I do kind of have a sort of a bonus question for you. Uh, and I just, I've heard this said before, and maybe you can help me out with it. Uh, in Ezekiel 18.4, it says, Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So one problem I've seen physicalists or Christian physicalists bring up is that uh, what does that mean that the soul shall die? And I know you gave kind of a key point just a moment ago on this, but um, maybe just talk about how you might be able to answer that biblically. Yeah. So off the top of my head, I'll say I'm not too sure because I'd have to look at the context and everything. But if I were to shoot from the hip, um, death is sometimes refers to uh, as some type of a separation uh, and again, I'm, 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 this is off the cuff from the hip. I needed, I would need to go back and study the, the context and the verse and, and what's being said, even look at uh, the Hebrew and whatnot. Um, but I, I know that when you, when you look at something like, okay, um, the Bible talks about the second death. Uh, the Bible talks of Adam and Eve that, that they'll surely die if they eat of this. Um, there seems to be this connotation, this correlation of death being correlated with a separation. When Adam and Eve ate, ate of the fruit, I'm not saying this is all that happened, but at least something that happened was they were separated from God. Um, the Bible talks about um, death, and I would say there's a separation of the soul and body. The Bible talks about the second death, which I would I, I could describe as an eternal separation from God. So you see death being some kind of a separation. Now, is that what this is referring to here? I'm not sure. But um, the, and the reason I say i got to look at the context is because you'll also find, kind of like what I was just talking about, sometimes there's a part to whole language being used. Um, like the Bible says that, um, you know, someone was dismayed and his face fell. Now, do we think that his face actually came off of his head and fell to the ground? No, it, it's, it's a way of, of expressing some type of idiom or something like that. That could be the case here without looking at the context deeply. Um, if it's talking about a death, it could be some type of a separation, or it could be using a cynic to talk, talk about a part to whole. And it could be referring to some type of idiom that they would have understood would have meant something in particular. So, yeah, it would just depend on me going back and having to really look at that. Yeah, you know, I've thought about this myself a little bit. And, you know, whenever I think of death in scripture as it relates to humanity, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip as well. It seems to always speak of the physical part of who we are that dies. And, you know, we use maybe something like um, an idiom like that poor soul. And like you said, we're always talking about that individual. We seem to, when we want to talk about the inward part of somebody, which I don't know if you ever saw Disney's movie, The Soul or Soul. It was real interesting. I can't even watch a Disney movie or any movie anymore without uh, you know, trying to pick it apart with philosophy or trying to see what the producer is thinking. I'm sure you're with me on that. Oh, um, yeah. But, you know, I watched it or you see something, uh, I'm trying to think of the other movie, Inside Out, the same kind of thing. It's just interesting, the psychology behind that. But I think everyone has this innate feeling that there's something about us, that identity we were talking about, something that even if on my way home, God forbid, I were to get an accident, I was paralyzed from the neck down uh, and all I had was just the, the mind that God gave me, the consciousness, and I'm able to continue to have enough faculties within my brain to uh, 
to communicate, um, there's still something about Jeremy that remains the same. And it seems to me in a verse like this, the reason why I bring this up is because this seems to be sort of the nail in the coffin, so to speak, you know, for lack of a better term, where uh, they just can't get over this. How can the soul die? And, and I, would, I would say that whenever we're talking about death, keep in mind we're talking about the death of a body. We're talking about because the unity of the body and the soul uh, is so united that something, something certainly dies. When you die and you say that soul died, there's a physical part of who you are, what it means to be you, because uh, that's why we have a resurrection to come, right? There is a complete glorification of the body. We were never meant to be just a soul, right? So part of us, in essence, does die, right? One day we will receive that resurrected body, as 2 Corinthians 5 talks about, uh, Philippians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, this is a great picture. That is a, a hope. So what's happened on the inside salvation will be completed on the outside. There will be a complete unity of the body and the soul again. So I would just encourage listeners that, hey, uh, we, we, we aren't just a soul. We aren't just a body, that there is a unity here that's always meant to be. And God is preparing us for really a realm that we don't completely understand. We can preach, we can teach, we can talk about, we can discuss, but we're still learning what it means to be a part of this place that God is preparing for us. So any thoughts on that, Eric, just to kind of feedback on what I'm saying here? Uh, yeah, um, as I was looking at different translations, um, that's sometimes where I start. Uh, so the NIV uh, says... Everyone who belongs to me, parents, child, both alike, the one who sins will die. So it, instead of soul, it says the one. It's talking about the uh, – seems mm. to be talking about biological life in mm. the uh, – in a – I think I got the NASB. Um, it says that all life is mine, um, both the one who sins shall die. So it's talking about life uh, verse uh, – in mm. the ESV, it says, behold, all souls are mine. And the Amplified, it says, behold, all souls are mine as well. So there seems to be, um, based on even just, just briefly looking at that, it seems to be referring to the life of the person while embodied. Um, because obviously, even from a Christian perspective, yeah. if I die, well, I'm still alive, but I don't have biological life. Um, now, so why, why would some translations use soul? Again, I, ha I haven't even looked at the Hebrew, but we do this even today. We say, oh, what a poor soul. Yep. Right. We, we're talking about the whole person. Yep. We're not talking about some kind of a Casper thing floating in the air. That's right. Um, or even uh, uh, if you fly a plane, uh, I knew someone who was a flight attendant. If you fly planes, the number of people on board, they call them uh, the I know that the, the acronym doesn't isn't the best, but it says that like say there's 45 people. It says 45 people SOB, 45 mm. souls on board. Mm -hmm. um, so even even there, wow. you, they, they count them by how many. They say souls on board. Um, so again, it, it the, the word soul can be used to refer to the entire person, including uh, their biological life. But as I said earlier, that's no different than saying um, uh, his face fell or I want all hands on deck. It's, it's, it's emphasizing something in particular to make a point of whatever it's trying to say. But there it seems to be implying a biological life. I agree. And thank you for pulling that out. Uh, I know sometimes as we talk about this, as part of it is just thinking through it. And this is important because sometimes, especially when we talk about scripture and we're talking about a worldview and what we believe, we want to make sure we're not just looking at one or two verses that might stump us. We're not looking to try to get out of something just because of a couple verses. And I realize I just want to say, especially to those, I've got friends uh, that believe in Christian physicalism. If you're watching this, I'm not saying that there's a onesie twosie and you're just trying to, you know, one up it. I know that you have a pretty robust uh, view. And um, but in the end, I think it's just important that when we come across these verses, uh, we do have a good reason, good explanation, at least when we talk about the soul when it comes to that part. Well, let's uh, let's end with this here, Eric. What did Jesus mean when he said in Mark, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Yeah, good question. And and before I touch on that, to even just uh, tag on to what you were saying, um, when, when we're reading something, we have to understand that whoever this was written to, 
they didn't have a hard time understanding it, even if we do. Because I hear some people say, oh, well, that's because, you know, the Bible's not clear. Or, oh, you got to, you know, pull from these things to make your point. Or, uh, But whenever this was written, whoever it was written to, they weren't confused. They knew exactly what was being said and what was meant. Uh, just because we don't, all that means is that we're, we're so much separated from the context and culture of the time. So every time you read something, you want to, one of the first questions you want to ask is, how would the audience who this was written to, how would they have understood what was written? And that's really important. So, uh, like, if I say it's running cats and dogs, if I say that to someone in a different country who's never heard that idiom, they would think I'm crazy and perhaps might imagine cats and dogs literally falling from the sky. But if I tell that to you, you know exactly what I mean. So, again, just because it's confusing to us at times, or we may not know immediately, that's what that's what hermeneutics is. That's what studying is. That's what textual criticism is. It's looking at the text, looking at the context, looking at the history, and unpacking how they would have understood it. Jesus says, what did it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Um, in this aspect, it's talking about uh, various things, but we can say this. You know, you, you look at some celebrities or some of the richest people in the world. Ironically, a lot of these people who have a lot of fame, a lot of fortune, a lot of glamour, a lot of followings tend to be some of the most depressed people, interestingly. Um, it, it, it's as if there's something to our existence and our body and our makeup that I, I've heard it said there's like a hole, if you will, a void, if you will, that needs to be filled up. There's something that we were made that we're born and we lack, that we don't have, that your soul, if you will, longs for. C.S. Lewis said, you know, if... if um, if I'm hungry, well, there exists something like food. If if a duckling wants to swim, there exists something like water. If uh, if a man wants uh, um, it, it wants to be intimate, have intercourse, where there's such a thing as sex, he says. So if if I find a craving or desire in me that this that nothing in this world can satisfy, then it must follow that I'm made for a different world. Jesus said we're we're in this world, but not of this world. I say all that to say every single person, uh, uh, anyone who's alive today. There is going to be at some point in your life, many points, at least one for sure, where it will be obvious that there is something you're missing, something you're lacking. Despite money, fame, or fortune, or or any kind of uh, um, popularity, there's going to be something you're lacking. And and this this ties in with what Jesus is saying. What what does it profit if you got everything you want materialistically? If you got all these riches, all this uh, glory, all these followers on Instagram or whatnot, which is another thing that is interestingly linked with depression, anxiety. Why? Because you open it up and you see the best of everyone. No one posts the worst on Instagram. They post the best pictures of themselves. And you kind of start to compare that and you begin to fill up this because we were made for drama, but you get drama in the wrong places. That's why reality shows are so popular. So we're constantly trying to feed something that that's never satisfied. And hence, what if you gained everything you wanted, everything you thought would satisfy you and yet you lose yourself. You lose your soul. There's no there's no fulfillment. There's a separation, a death of the soul, if you will, from God. And hence what he's saying is, what we'll say here is, I don't know where the person's at, uh, whoever's listening, but perhaps there, there, there may be something that you felt you've maybe you should be happy, but you're not. And let me say this too, because I don't want to be misconstrued. Happiness is not the end of the uh, is not the end result. It's not the end goal. As a Christian, I'm not always happy. So, well, if it's not happiness, if it's not you know fame and fortune, what is it? Well, it you have to look at what we were designed and made to be and do, and the way we we're designed to flourish. If I say my phone is is a bad phone, it's implying that it is dysfunctional and it is not operating the way it ought to operate. So I can't throw my phone under you know so many feet of water. Why? Because it's not made to do that. And if I do that, I will mess it up. My phone was not meant to be stepped on with a lot of weight because again, it'll mess it up. There are times where my, where my life feels you know like it's quote messed up. And although I own my life, although I own you know this computer, if it breaks, I can't fix it. I send it to the manufacturer. Why? Because although it's under my name, I didn't make it. There have been times in my life where life feels like it's broken, if you will. And although it's my life, I didn't make it. And even if I gain the whole world, I am losing my soul. And if, I, if I'm if i not right with God, I will lose my soul in the afterlife as well, so to speak. It will be hell. So the beautiful thing is there is an answer to this, and that is that Christ came. He he, he knows that we're broken. He knows uh, uh, that we're needed of a Savior. What I love about Christianity is that every single religion will say you have to do X, Y, and Z to achieve God's goodness or grace or mercy or love. And you have to reach this level to get to God. 
And Christianity is the only religion that says, no, 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 you can never reach me. And because of that, I will come down and reach you. Because you can't get to my level, I'll come to yours. And Christ stepped into flesh and came to us and died for us. So even if you have the world, don't lose your soul. Accept Christ. He's, he's, he's the manufacturer of your life, your body. He knows how it's supposed to be used. And perhaps you haven't used it the right way, but that's what salvation's for. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And I want to let you know that if you have questions about God, you have questions about truth, um, I want to encourage you to check out the link in the description of this video, What is Truth? It's a video that I put together that goes into more detail about salvation, how you can know God, how you can get right. And uh, I am interested in helping you to understand truth, not just Christianity. Of course, I believe in Christianity because Christianity is true. But there's so much more to truth than just what we call Christianity. And we want to help you to understand truth. That's why we have these discussions. Not every discussion that I have is with a believer. You look on my channel, I have discussions also with unbelievers, and I hope to continue that. I really want us to understand the origin of belief. I want us to have a conversation about uh, why we believe what we believe. I believe it's important that we do that because we're living in a culture right now where it seems like everyone is yelling past each other. We just cancel each other if we don't like it. And we need to make sure that we have respectable conversations. We're listening. In the end, we have to uh, believe that uh, truth wins, that the best ideas win. Because if we don't, then boy, all of this is pretty useless. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It becomes meaningless. So I hope that this has uh, been of value to you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, be sure you check out um, his his uh, website. It'll be linked in the description as well as his YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for being uh, on the program here today. And uh, I just ask you, share your comments in the comment section there, your feedback, any anything that you'd like to share, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Eric, for coming on today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, and remember this, that actual faith is not just some blind leap of ignorance into darkness. The actual faith is trusting and believing the unknown because of the known.